But then why aren't we doing it? I, this well, is I what I think is well, necessary in the 21st century, to I change don't. the paradigm. Let, let me jump in here. I, I was just in Costa Rica. And <laughs> Costa, Very Rica, good. Costa Rica, as you know, abolished its military. And that has meant that all the money that was used for the military has been used for social issues, social development, and for the environment. It's the only country I know of that has got the rights of the environment and living things as part of their constitution. And, of course, the model is so tantalizing. If the world gave up its military, there'd be no more poverty. We'd have money for everything. And all the things we're discussing now would be unnecessary. But the, the problem is that while you have powers and nation states and fear and greed, yeah. the selfish gene in its raw form, you don't get that kind of, that kind of, of yeah. altruism. We have made advances. We have now reached a stage where just about everybody in the world thinks that slavery is is um, beyond the pale, cannibalism is beyond the pale, um, various other things that, that used to be accepted and one would have said just as pessimistic, oh you'll never get rid of slavery, how could you possibly get rid of slavery and, and we've done it. So I, I do think that, that there might be grounds for hope. I could just tell one little uh, story arising out of Richard's um, point about the um, Picasso. Um, Wilson has a nice, E.O. E. Wilson has a nice um, uh, way of putting the economic p point, which is that the, in the, um, uh, the, the Amazon rainforests, so much of the, of the sort of goods are up in the trees and so little is in the soil at any, any one time, that to knock down trees in order to turn the land into agriculture for a very short time, it, he, I think the way he puts it is, well, you can make a living doing that, but it's rather like burning an old master to eat your, to cook your dinner. Yeah, exactly. I just happened to have been very recently in Ethiopia where, with the help of the international institutions, um, there is reforestation. It's not going at the rate to keep up with the growth in population, therefore there is still an erosion, but there's reforestation, and it's illegal now, despite the country being the poorest country in the world, heavily dependent, if you're a poor peasant, on wood for heating and for building. It is illegal to take down any trees, and there are serious um, penalties. You know, you go to court and you're, and you're fined if you do it. And it gets out quite quickly, because if farmers know they're short of water, because there is um, practices which are eroding the soil, um, they quickly wake up and know there's a problem. They may not have the solution at, at, at hand. But that's exactly the problem. I mean, it, there was a land commission that I organised when I was uh, head of the civil service in Kenya that went around the country registering people's concerns about the land in Kenya. The, the, the staple diet in Kenya is a type of food that has to be cooked to be digested. And if you haven't got access to energy that you pay for, then you have to use the energy that you pick up. And you pick up firewood or you make charcoal. Now, this is why I think poverty is such a, such, such, such a central issue to this. I don't think there's anyone in Kenya who would say that we don't want to reforest the land. There's nobody that I can think of on a, on a broad scale who'd say it's a good thing we've cut down all the forests. Everybody's desperate to save what we have, but how do we do it in the face of the fact that more and more people can't cook a meal at the end of the day? Well, then, could, could the problem be solved by throwing money at it? I mean, if you, if you could actually tax Americans and us and, and, and pay for fuel that was not local firewood, would, would that solve a, a well, big... I, I think if you gave everybody in Kenya a point of electricity with, with, a, with a burner stove and one bulb, you'd reduce forest depletion by an incredibly large factor and have enormous positive results on water catchment and, and the regeneration of healthy environments. And there's, there's no doubt, in, I mean, if you, if you talk to, to UN of, of officials, they will tell you that if the rich countries got up their share to 0.7, which is the UN target of GDP spent on development aid. If you actually had a trading system which meant that um, more money went to the poor countries rather than it being brought back here through subsidies and tariff barriers, if you reverse that, you would make a fantastic difference simply on a monetary basis. You would be doing exactly what you said. Can I? Jane. Um, yeah. Gombe National Park, where the chimpanzee study is, is very tiny. It's only about 30 square miles. 
And when I flew over it 15 years ago in a small plane, um, I suddenly realized the extent of deforestation outside the park was it, shocking. It happened fairly fast. It happened partly as a result of the villagization, Ujamaa, partly as a result of refugees pouring across the border from Burundi. And it wasn't that some trees had gone, it was that basically all the trees except in the very steep ravines had gone. And that led to a program initially funded by the European Union that we called Take Care, T-A-C-A-R-E. And it, it's quite a holistic program. We began with 12 villages. We're now in 22 and about to be in 34. And it's a program which starts off with in each of the villages where the program is, is tree nurseries. It's um, growing woodlots. It's conservation education for kids and for adults. It's primary health care delivered through the regional medical authorities because it's never been a program with very much money. It's concentrating on women, improving their self-esteem, scholarships for gifted girls so they can go on to secondary school because it's been shown all around the world that as women's education improves, family size drops. Um, providing family planning, AIDS education and various other things. And it, the reason it, it was picked up so well by the villagers is because this was not a group of white people going into a black African village and saying, we're really sorry you're so poor, but we, can, we, we want to help you and this is what we're going to do for you. It was rather going in with a sort of menu and saying, here's a program and these are the kind of things that we could help you to do. And has that changed? Attitudes well, towards the chimpanzees? Totally. We're using um, firewood, Richard, but from the woodlots, which are close to the village, and these little stoves made by the Canadians, which are very, very fuel efficient. Which takes me on to um, what is arguably perhaps the, the greatest immediate and obvious environmental uh, threat, global warming. Richard, how do you... Do you have optimism that the capacity of the human brain to override the genetic disposition of the selfish gene um, can so affect, for instance, the President of the United States, that this would come <laughs> onto the agenda more effectively? Take more than that. <laughs> well, you haven't chosen the most ideal example. To... <laughs> uh, I... No, cl clearly not. I mean, th there are, as I said, there are people of goodwill and altruism in the, in the world, and there are people in important offices running the world, and the two don't necessarily coincide. And that's an understatement for the example you've just, just raised. <laughs> um, I was very, uh, very encouraged by uh, Richard Leakey saying that just a, a bit of money... To, to, to supply every, every peasant in Africa with, with the wherewithal to, to cook the food and not need firewood would make a dramatic difference. Um, if that were generally understood, I suspect most of us would... I mean, how, how much would it actually amount to in the, in the way of a, a tax on each one of us? Not a lot, would it? I think it's a much bigger question than, than whether you give free handouts of energy... By, by everyone saving a little here and giving it over there. I don't think anyone wants free handouts. But how do we get food to where people are hungry? How do we get energy to where people have none? And I think one of the things that environmentalists have got to discuss and, 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 and reconsider, and I'm quite sure I'm not going to get any support from the panel here on this one, and that is, in, in the history of humanity, only one type 